if there is no objection, let's um, come out of recess for the committee meetings, and we will do 3.0, the welcome portion, which is reception of guests. Um, guests, you are welcome. Uh, after we do agenda revisions, we'll go to public comments, but first, 3.2, agenda revisions. Um, do we have any? Please speak up if, um, Jonas. Yes, I would like to, uh, to add an agenda item uh, for the board to act on the draft agreement with the teachers union. You would like an agenda item to act on the board, uh, on the board agreement with the teachers union. Yes. That would, um, we would perhaps have that as uh, 5.2A, an addendum to 5.2A, would that be acceptable? I think that we would want to do it um, after. First, after, new, after executive yeah. session? Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's do that then. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, any other agenda revisions? Um, do I see any hands? I do not see any other hands. So in that case, we may go to public comments. And um, I think, uh, I, I certainly hope that, um, I see Corinne is here and David and, um, and uh, others um, that I can't keep track of, but, um, but who are welcome nonetheless. Uh, do any of you have any comments that you would like to make? Uh, this is David Lawrence from Middlesex. Uh, none, thank you. No comments, David? Okay. Um, Corinne? Nothing for me either, thanks. Okay, thank you. And um, there's, uh, there's a Jay Parker, is that, Jody Parker, did I understand? Yes, it is. Hi. Uh, you're welcome to make a comment if you like. Uh, nothing at this time. Okay, very good. Um, anyone else who would who would like to, uh, any other member of the public who would uh, like to make a comment or, or like not to make a comment, um, please speak up in the next five seconds or I'll proceed. Okay, thank you very much. So let's then move on to 4.0, response to coronavirus discussion. And Deborah, I'll turn this over to you. Yes, um, because there's been so much activity in this project, uh, we I recently shared with you a detailed document that is a version of an active document that all of our uh, administrative team has been working on since the middle of March. Um, so I'm going to ask you to go to your email, if you please, and uh, open up that document. It's called a copy of WCUUSD, and you have a view version of that. Um, so by providing you with this um, in its raw form, uh, I wanted to let you know my purpose was because I wanted you to see the chronology of work that's been occurring in each team. And I believe that every team leader is here from our leadership team. Um, as you can see, we have administrators who are leading this work. So um, I would invite them if they'd be willing, or I can certainly do so if they would prefer just to walk through the most recent ad additions. I know the board had expressed an interest in hearing directly from the team leaders. Uh, so I, as I think that almost all of them are with us this evening, that would be perhaps one way to go. Um, let me just check in with our administrative team and see if they have located the document as well. Um, could one of you tell me if you have it in your email, please? One of your, I sent it to the group. Okay, it's there, great. So let's start at the top. And I'd be happy to speak to any of these areas, but if not, um, I'll team with the, um, 
administrator who is leading and Jody Emerson is leading the uh, food or meal provision program. Hi, Jody. Would you, be, if, would you be willing to give a quick update to the board about the work that's been uh, going on in the last few weeks? Sure, we have um, a great group of people helping us out in food service. Um, lots of our food service people from across the district, along with paraeducators and a couple of teachers have been working daily in different shifts. We have a morning shift um, preparing meals. We have a packing cooler packing shift and a loading the buses shift. They kind of work together. We then have the delivery folks, which is a bus driver and at least two people on each bus to help with deliveries. And um, then we have kind of our cleanup crew after that. So a lot of people every day, at least 32 people every day through a variety of shifts that are supporting this work. We every day this week have seen an increase in the number of meals served. We expect to continue to see that increase as more and more people are home for longer amounts of time and needing uh, sometimes a change of pace. Sometimes they're um, being laid off and they're needing another resource. And we're getting more outreach from families who have younger kids who are not yet in our system who are hoping to access this as well. Thank you, Jody. Does anyone have questions for us about the meal work that's underway? Um, are we saying yes? Are we saying yes to everybody? I hope. Everyone is eligible. It's a universal access program now. Great. Thank you. Yes, and that, that universal access is retroactive to March 20th. So everything was taken care of, um, but we were never turning people away. Great. Thank you. Jody, I have a question. This is Jill about. Um, just safety precautions to keep staff safe. Are there things in place? Does everyone have gloves and masks and things that they need? We have plenty of gloves. We do have people wearing masks, though they're not required by the USDA or the AOE. Um, it is something that people can choose. And most of our, almost all of our delivery people choose to wear them. And everyone who's working in the kitchen chooses to wear a mask. So we do have masks and, and gloves. They, everybody uses gloves no matter what. We also have um, hand sanitizer on the buses so that between handing out meals, they can sanitize their hands or gloves or both. Um, so they carry a box of gloves on each bus, hand sanitizer on each bus um, to help with that. And they've been spoken to many times about making sure there's distance between them on the buses or the spaces are laid out in a way that they are uh, separated from each other. And Great, Jody, jo thanks. Jody, this is Scott. Um, you've indicated that the demand is increasing. Do you feel that you have the capacity to meet further increases in demand? I think we do. Um, one concern I have is that when, if or when, um, and I really think it's a when, we do start to have people getting sick or um, getting tired, we do need a backup resource of people that can volunteer to help continue these deliveries and making the food. We have had Capstone, uh, if you've looked at the document, you see this, that Capstone had reached out. They have over a thousand volunteers and they were wondering how they could help. So uh, we are hoping to bring in a couple and discuss how they might help and let them get a look at the operations and consider how they might support us we're thinking they might need background checks. They believe they have some people who already have those in place, um, but we might be able to start a rotation um, using additional folks so that we could split our folks in half and use them every other week and then use that other source of personnel. So that's, that's something on the horizon. Jody, can I um, just put something in the back of your mind for thinking of rotation is, um, two weeks is kind of our quarantine time. So just maybe thinking about a two week rotation might be Absolutely have thought of that. It's the it, safest that way to was go. My first thought. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yep. 
Um, I got a really uh, uh, comprehensive email from Brian Stetcher, I think a couple weeks ago now at this point, about the procedures that they're going through to make sure that the food is safe, um, which, which made me feel great. Jael, I just forwarded that to you. Um, has any more thought been, so I guess my first question is, you know, where buses are stopping, you know, at intersections, right? Um, are people congregating there? Um, and has there been any more thought or planning given to running the buses along the routes, along routes where they don't usually run to make sure that all, you know, houses with kids are, are covered there instead of uh, people having to go out, you know, and congregate at the intersection of Gould Hill and Cowles Road? So um, I actually have no idea how many people might be congregating in one place. So that's something I need to find out more about. Um, I know that there's one stop that I can think of off the top of my head that has a lot of people that receive food there, but I believe they leave coolers. Uh, but that's a good that's a good question, and I'll, I'll have to do some research on that. Uh, second part of your question, remind me. What's the second part of your question? Yeah, running running uh, running buses on roads where they don't normally go because right. Right. Uh, thank you. We have had people reach out and when they reach out, we get their address and we add it if they're not on our route. So it's basically right now, it's by people reaching out to myself or Michelle Sepka or being referred to us by someone else. Um, and so Family Center of Washington County has referred people to us, for example. And then we find out where they are, if they have access to one of the stops already. And if they don't, then we add them to our route. So we are adding. That's great, thank you, Jody. Gillian, I know that you collected some of that information in your survey, uh, one of your surveys uh, from, from, a, from a couple of weeks ago. Is there coordination with, uh, with Jody and her team? Oh yeah, the survey that I sent out was actually from Jody. So yeah, I was just the agent. It just okay. made me look good. Got yeah. it, yes it did, thank you. Um, Jody, well, first of all, it's an incredible effort and it, I, I've been amazed to see how it's come together. So I just want to commend you. Um, really hard work. Um, one thing I've been thinking about is mud season. Um, I think last year, a couple of times the buses weren't running. Um, so I just didn't know if you, you've probably given that some thought, but it, uh, it's certainly on my mind as a thing that could happen. Um, they've experienced a little bit of that already. And I think we'll just keep dealing with it as best we can. Um, we, we, de we dealt with a number of different scenarios, as you can imagine, um, some with less people, less traffic on the roads, our buses are going a little faster than we had anticipated. So we, we were a little off track on that. So we've slowed buses down or changed times um, and tried to communicate with families around that. So there's, there's little things that happen um, each day and we're trying to keep up with that and keep people abreast of those changes. So if it's a timing change because of mud that makes us go slower or less traffic, which makes us go faster, we're trying to let people on those routes know that. Yeah. I, I think they were fully, I think there were a couple days though when the roads in Middlesex in some parts were entirely impassable by the buses and they couldn't run at all. So it, it just, you know, I, I don't know what, it's just something to, to keep to consider because I think it happened at least once, if not twice last year when there were no buses. Um, okay, that is good to know. We might have to employ our vans then. Yes. Thank you, Jody. Does anyone have any further questions? Um, this is Lindy. I don't have a question, but in response a little bit to Jonas, I've heard anecdotally from a couple of people I, um, talk to that the bus driver or delivery person has, and it's two different routes that I heard this from are very explicit in their directions of how far to stay away and where we'll put the food and um, giving people their directions about not being too close to the bus or not being too close to each other. Uh, and the one person I was talking to today said, at first we were a little scared by it and then we realized, no, they're just trying to inform us all about how this is working and now we know and we all spread out. So it sounded like they had good direction and they're sharing it with the people they're delivering food to. All right, did, did Mary Lynn have a question? I don't know if I saw your hand up. No, no it was just the two weeks. 
thinking okay. about and Jody was on top of that. Okay. Great. So if you don't mind, I'd like to suggest that we move on to the next area, which is special services. And Kelly, um, this section begins on page three and goes on to page five of your document. Um, so I'd like to ask Kelly to please provide us with a, an update. This is an uh, area that's changing by the moment. Yes, it certainly is. And I think Bill Dice is here as well. So Bill, feel free to chime in. I can't see you, so cut me off if you wanna jump in. Um, so Bill and I have been working closely. Um, I uh, stay very closely in touch. I'm, I'm a member of the Vermont Council of Special Ed Administrators Board. So I am meeting with that crew pretty regularly around just guidance around how to manage our current situation. As you know, the first announcement of this first period of time, we were in the maintenance of learning and that had some different implications for special education than it does as we move to the continuation of learning. So we had a plan in place for this, this first uh, period of time. And then just yesterday, um, I rolled out to the case managers across the district, um, the new plan going forward and how um, we might be able to prov provide specialized instruction to students uh, in light of our current situation. <laughs> that's the language we're using. Um, that's the advice we've gotten from legal counsel at this point. Um, and in, in light of the current situation, obviously, as you know, is um, related to this distance learning and online learning for students. And so our special educators are really starting to get creative around how we can meet the needs of kids in this venue. Um, case managers will be asked to create a distance learning plan for every student that's on an IEP. Um, and that needs to be in effect by the 13th of April. So they will be reaching out to families if they haven't already to develop this plan. Um, and Again, that's gonna look different for every student depending on their needs. I've been meeting with all of our independent school providers and talking about how we're meeting the needs of the kids that are in alternative programs, all of our contracted service providers to figure out you know, what it means for the kiddos that had support services from outside agencies. Um, I have weekly office hours, so to speak, um, set up with the elementary case managers, with the high school, with Bill, uh, meeting with our eval team. As you know, special ed has some pretty specific timelines that are outlined for us. And we are in this place where we don't have access to kids. So our evaluations are um, coming to a screeching halt <laughs> and we're figuring out what that means. And again, within the special ed time, uh, time parameters and legalities that we are required to follow. Um, we are you know, working with legal counsel to manage that. Thankfully, um, I'm sure you've heard, we're getting consistent and regular updates from Visbit, um, and that is helpful so that we're getting consistent information across to the state. It's not specific to us um, around how to manage this. And I anticipate that the there's gonna be lots of changes within special ed coming from the federal level um, within that stimulus package that just got passed. Uh, Secretary Betsy DeVos has 30 days to roll out some changes to IDEA. And so um, again, through the VCSEA, I'm watching that very closely and we anticipate that there's gonna be changes around due dates and timelines for us. And I will continue to keep our case managers and the uh, principals apprised of all of that information that's coming our way. In this particular document, I have two links here that I think you'll be able to see. The first one is the presentation that I gave to the case managers yesterday. Um, that also within it, there's embedded um, links to all of the documentation and things that they're required to do from service logs to communication logs and the distance learning plan. And then the second link there is um, a professional development plan that I recently put together for our support staff, for the paraeducators. Um, and just recently, I think Amy Molina's on the line. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> she has um, jumped in and helped me 
um, do some research and find some resources to include on that. Um, I just was having a hard time staying on top of everything all at once. And so I greatly appreciate her support in that. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's questions or, I mean, I can get much more detail, could go through this presentation with you if you want it. <laughs> Does anyone have questions for Kelly? I, I guess for me, it's just uh, saying thank you and wanting to make sure you have all of the resources that you need from from us and or from any, you know, like how can we support this work? Because it's really, we don't want to have uh, a lot of, uh, of these kids fall off the tracks quickly. So do you have the flexibility? You were mentioning independent schools. Do you have the flexibility to work out plans with them? to this new learning? Yes, yeah, so all of the independent schools that we have are actually um, helping and creating distance learning plans um, for the students that they're, they've been serving for us. Um, and so going forward, in terms of what that means for us, um, we will eventually need to take a look at our contracts and to see what that means and maybe potentially do some renegotiating around what the remainder of the year looks like um right now legal guidance has said leave things alone let things get figured out um and then once we know what kids need right we're in the very beginning stages of figuring this out um we'll take a look at those details um but right now we just need some time to figure out those you know how we're going to support kids in this new and inventive way Kelly, are you seeing increased need? Are you seeing additional needs happening now as you know that are as a result of the crisis? Um, I so I think some of our families that typically struggle um, or kids that we have challenges with when within the system that is starting to be exacerbated in the home. And so um, we're trying to find creative ways from a distance to support families. Um, you know, some of our behavior support folks are helping families to create daily schedules, daily routines, some behavior incentive programs to implement in the home. Um, things that we would typically do during the school day, they're just helping and doing that consultation via phone, via Zoom, um, in order to best support the students in this current situation. But yes, we have, there is a many families reaching out and asking for support. Kelly. Yeah. Um, are the the para educators, I know that they're they're helping with the rotation of calls, but those of them that are working as the one-on-ones um, for kids, are they able to be in touch with those families more frequently? Is that, has that been happening or is that what your plan might be? Because um, they are such a, such a key part of that kid's daily interaction right so that's um some of that has been happening and as we work with families um we're you know offering some of that daily support daily check-in for the kids um i think right now families are really overwhelmed yeah by the the number of people that they're hearing from and the support right it's while it's it's uh, welcomed but at the same time they're trying to figure out their own home situation yeah. i do anticipate over the next couple of weeks, when they start to get into some of their routines, that would be um, more readily able to, you know, be accepted and utilized. Yeah. Um, and thankfully, this distance learning plan, the way in which it's been rolled out, does provide us some flexibility. So that right now we offer supports to families if they say we're not ready, we're not able, we'll check in again in a week or two, and that plan can be easily modified and added to or changed as we go through this. And one thing when I was listening to us, uh, I think it was in the Senate Ed Committee yesterday was this concern with the um, continuity education plan of if families aren't able to accept some of the services, um, what, and it looks like a refusal, um, then what does that mean long-term for compensatory services? I, that was a big discussion, and I wondered if you guys have talked about that, or has it, or is it just something kind of at a later date to discuss? That that was inter an interesting thing that came up. 
Yeah, so I've um, had some preliminary conversations with our special educators about this mm -hmm. and the importance of having our data points now in terms of where kids are at today with their learning or where they were a week ago uh, and continuing to monitor their progress even while we're in this scenario and then um, where they're at when we return. And those data points will be what will help us to determine who would be eligible for compensatory services when we come back into session. But again, I think if families aren't able to, you know, if there's services that um, would normally happen in the school, but given their current living situation, if they say we just kind of need to hold back on this a little bit or modify this, Mm -hmm. Is that then going to be a potential impact um, of, of contention for compensatory services? And it, it sounded like it sounded like Aaron McGuire was was understanding that that language wasn't perfect and, and needed to be talked about. Uh, so I, I think I just wanted to bring it up as that seems like it could um, hopefully doesn't pose any problems. Sounds like right. something we'll need to get further legal guidance on, perhaps. Would you agree, Kelly? Yeah, and I think that every situation is unique, and we look at every, you know, IEP team has to consider all aspects of each child's situation and make the best informed decisions around that. That's perfect. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Uh, Kelly, I just want to commend you on your Zoom setup. You you just have a you just you have such a nice background happening, nice positioning. I'm I'm very impressed by it. Thanks. I'm, I'm getting good at it. <laughs> I have work to do. Yeah, I, you can inspire me. <laughs> It's a new area for all of us to work on, right? <laughs> I know. I know. Shall, shall we proceed then to instruction? <laughs> yes. <coughs> so that begins on page uh, five, and I'd invite Jen to share some highlights. And there's certainly been a lot happening in this area, including uh, new guidance and templates on our continue, continue, uh, continuity of learning Excuse me, plan that um, we're in the process of developing with our teachers. So when we last met uh, with you as a board, we had just articulated common expectations for our teachers and had created a remote learning site to start to compile some resources. But at that point in time, we were very much in a period of maintenance and just starting that work. So. Since then, we've definitely ensured that um, we're connecting with our students and their families. Um, U32 in particular is using the TA system a lot and our elementaries all established a, um, a system whereby every family was, and student was getting checked on by at least two adults, uh, their classroom teacher and another adult in the building. All of that has been happening. We have been um, really focused on maintenance, and um, I will say that, that that's been a challenge for us. I think that our teachers are so, um, so incredibly eager. I think they're doing above and beyond what they would need to do in a period of maintenance. We're gathering some information um, from families, uh, anecdotally, sometimes even uh, we will hear people uh, on a bus run or we'll get an email just to, to help us um, improve communication. I think we've probably been erring on the side of too much communication is what we've heard. It's a, it can be a bit overwhelming, so we're trying to figure that out. You know that on um, March 26th was when we found out that we're going to be in this period of prolonged school dismissal and we're moving to continuity of learning and some new learning. And so we have shifted gears. The instructional task force met that Friday. So the announcement came on a Thursday evening. The instructional task force met on Friday and there was no guidance yet from the state at that point in time. So we really spent our time articulating um, our guiding principles as we enter this period of prolonged school dismissal, generating questions 
attempting to answer questions if we could, um, and seeing what existed for guidance from the AOE absent a template for the continuity of learning plan. They did publish something this weekend that was um, awfully aspirational and um, and quite quite uh, cumbersome. They've since revised the template, and that was just released today. Thank goodness, it's a lot more streamlined. Um, I think that the guiding principles in the AOE template are very similar to our guiding principles, really focusing on connection with students and families, really considering issues of equity, which I said um, earlier this evening in the, um, in the Ed Quality Group, that the inequities that have existed in our system all along right now are being exacerbated and are being... Uh, are much more obvious to us than they might be day to day when kids are reporting to school. Now we're, we have more understanding of um, the capacity for parental support or not, access to the internet, familiarity, all of those things. So we need to really hold that as we enter this period of um, prolonged school dismissal. We also are um, really needing to, um, to be realistic with ourselves to figure out what are the most important things for our students to learn, to know and be able to do in this last quarter of the school year when they are learning remotely. And, um, and then what is that gonna mean for us going forward when we are all reunited back at school eventually? So we're thinking about that, uh, thinking about the transferable skills, um, thinking about how to be responsive to families and really holding the fact that our teachers and paraeducators are also working from home, in many cases, taking care of their own families, balancing things that in a million years they couldn't have anticipated having to balance. And so we want to create a continuity of learning plan that is reasonable and flexible. We want to maintain communication and continuity as much as possible. And we need to create a plan that is going to be flexible enough for our teachers and our paraeducators to do their jobs and take care of themselves and their families at the same time. Mm -hmm. So um, we've looked at a couple of models. Again, I want to um, a shout out to the U32 administrative team. They, um, they've really uh, led the, the way in looking at other models. Texas had had a response plan just from various natural disasters in the past. Kansas has work that... U32 got their hands on and shared with us before the AOE had the opportunity to do that. So looking at those guiding documents, thinking about the systems and the supports, I want to um, also hold up our elementary principals who've been balancing a whole lot of things and still thinking about continuity of learning and, um, and not having answers to questions that are really pressing for our teachers and some families so far as we work this out. And, um, and also to... Uh, technology to Keith and the tech crew really helping us figure out issues of access and equity and how to shift from a period of maintenance where maybe packets were sufficient when families didn't have internet to um, to this next phase of continuity of learning and some new learning where we are going to have to um, engage in some direct instruction and we're going to have to be creative about how we do that when we have um, families that have some access issues. We also know that we need to be flexible because even though there might be a device in every house, there might only be one device in every house. And families are all working from home or they're all on at the same time. And so we have some issues of internet service that we're contending with as well. So we're thinking about hybrid models, um, balancing some synchronous uh, gathering times and learning times with asynchronous learning times. Um, now that we have that template, we can put all that thinking that we've been doing and, and early work uh, together in one draft continuity of learning plan. That is my charge to bring to the instructional task force tomorrow so that we can all look at it, work on it together, own it together, and then share it out more broadly with um, our teaching community. U32 uh, faculty looked at some of the earliest pieces of that template today and added their input. So we've got that already. The elementary principals, um, Keith, Kelly, Deborah, and I met today for a while to focus on that for elementary. 
that's going forward, that plan needs to su be submitted to the AOE by the 8th of April. I think our biggest challenge right now, and I would welcome any of my colleagues who are in this meeting to speak out, is um, how we are going to shift from maintenance of learning to this next phase of remote or continuity of learning uh, for in a prolonged state. We need time to get our teachers ready to do this well. Um, you know, that whole idea of going slow to go fast, we need some time to, to get ourselves organized and ready so that we can launch this with the streamlined communication system and a level of predictability that our students and our families and our teachers need. And I'd like to, at this point, just briefly address the last part of Jen's comments uh, in relation to the time that we need. Um, as you are aware, we have um, a negotiated agreement with our teachers and our support staff, which identifies the number of instructional days and the number of in-service days. Um, and um, we also have uh, um, individuals who support, who who um, been working with us to try, to try to come up with some amendments and adjustments. And unfortunately, we've not reached um, a final level of agreement about what that might look like. And I realize you're thinking, my goodness, it's next week. Um, however, it's true that we just received the final guidance on the um, con continuity of learning plan this afternoon. And we have been working um, in preparation, as Jen was just describing, to bring all of our ideas together to coalesce and then to move forward with a plan that will drive our next phase of transition. So um, uh, this is a, a rare request, but I'm going to make it and I'll ask you know all of you to, um, to query further if you have more questions about it. But um, I would like to ask the board's permission to have flexibility in how we schedule our time for teachers next week. Um, I'm not suggesting that we will not be working, but there's a high degree of interest on the part of our leadership team and our principals in particular that uh, based on feedback that they have received from their staff, um, you've already heard from our special services group and know that we have IEPs that need to be rewritten. Uh, we'd like to devote a fair amount of our time next week to doing the work in preparation for the, the next phase of the remaining part of the school year. Um, the reason why we don't have a complete proposal is because um, there's been a lot of conversation and iterations, but we haven't reached a final agreement. So my request is that you would allow myself, the leadership team, working with the association to come up with a plan that will enable us to get this work accomplished next week um, and trust that we will do our best to honor the needs of the families and the community and of course all of you as we make that plan and, um, and I would communicate that out to the board just as soon as it's been finalized. Any comments from board members? Um, I have a couple questions for, for Jen. Um, can you just describe the difference between the maintenance that we're currently in now and continuity of learning uh, that we're transitioning into? How would they look different? Yeah, I, so the, the biggest part about maintenance was about reaching out and making connections with students and families and just maintaining learning, uh, really mitigating the loss of learning that would happen when kids were not in school. We're now entering into a next phase where there's going to be an expectation for some new learning. Um, we have a quarter of the year left and, um, and lots of expectations that we hadn't even addressed yet or that kids hadn't had enough opportunities yet to practice so that they could develop um, their proficiencies. It's that piece, though, that um, Chris, that I think is really important that we, we are going to need to pare down our expectations. There is no way that remotely we are going to be able to address everything that we would have done if our kids were in school with us. So, you know, as I heard at the U32 faculty meeting today, think of everything you want to do in quarter four, cut it in half, and then cut it in half again, right? So we're trying to think about um, how, 
how to help our teachers are to identify what are the most important things that kids need to know. How do we set up those learning opportunities? How do we systematically collect data about what is not going to be addressed this year, given this period of prolonged school dismiss dismissal? And then we're going to have to think about what that means for us for next mm -hmm. year and 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 future years. Actually, I don't I don't know that we're going to um, clean all of clean all of this up or address it in um, in just one school year. Actually, I, as I said earlier, this is going to have reverberations. I think for a long time. Um, so you know, if if we can look at the opportunity to really shift our thinking about what school is and what it looks like and sounds like maybe down the line, I guess I'm I'm going to have to remain optimistic that there will be some silver lining learning in this whole period that we're in. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. That's helpful. Jaya? Thank you. Yeah, I, Jaya? I really commend you, Jen, and all the teachers um, and administrators and everything you're doing. Um, it's been a little overwhelming. Jasmine received 159 emails in less than a week. And um, <laughs> she had kind of a little breakdown because it was really overwhelming and she didn't know, she couldn't keep track of it. And I was working and I haven't been able to keep track of it. And I know that a lot of people are experiencing the same thing. Um, I have a few clarifying questions as a parent more than I guess a board member. Um, one is she said something about not being graded the same way right now because students are trying to catch up on things. Who I should be, should I just be emailing principals? I feel like I don't want to overwhelm people um, with emails <laughs> the way I'm being overwhelmed. And then my third comment was just my niece who's in Colorado, their school's um, extended spring break. And I don't know um, if we could look at that, like just having a longer, like a two week spring break rather than just a one week long spring break to just help everyone adjust and if that's a possibility and would that be a poor decision to extend that so i'm going to try to remember all three of those things and, and respond to them one is the communication piece i think that um the feedback that you've provided and a few others um, that is exactly why we need to look at streamlining our communication. There is not a doubt in my mind that every single one of us is so well intentioned and it is hard for us not to be seeing our kids all the time and reaching out to them. And, um, and we are hearing that kids are overwhelmed, families are overwhelmed by the amount of correspondence, even appreciating how well intentioned it is. So that communication is part of that continuity of learning plan. We're gonna to have to come to some agreements about that and put some systems in place so that you are getting sort of the just right amount of information. And I would fully expect that what we, whatever we do in the first week or two of remote learning, um, we'll do better the next week and we'll do better the next week, right? It's in partnership together. We're gonna to have to figure that out, right? That's why it's as, um, unsettling, I think, as this period of maintenance has been. There have been so few answers overall. It has been a good opportunity for us to just test the waters and try things out, uh, get smarter. You know, Kelly was saying about Zoom, like I think all we have all had so many Zoom meetings now. We understand some of the basic protocols and those things are, are just going to get better and better. So thank you for that feedback. Um, Regarding assessment, part of what we're going to have to uh, figure out together as well is what are those assessment practices. You know, there is no, there are so many variables for at home learning right now um, that we have to think deeply about what is the evidence that students can show, for, can can use to demonstrate their learning. How how valid is it? How reliable is it? What does that mean in the long term? You know, how do, how, how do we figure that out? And I think we have to accept that anything that a kid is showing us right now is just a, a snapshot of what they're able to do right now. And it's not sort of necessarily summative. Um, and that anything that we do, we're gonna have to give opportunities for um, kids to show more evidence or reperform or reassess whatever we wanna call it when the time comes and we're all back together again. 
And then the third thing, Jael, I would say is that we have had a lot of conversations, as Deborah said before, about the nervousness in the system about suddenly transitioning from maintenance to remote learning and, and the need for us to have time and, um, and how much or how little flexibility might um, exist around that, especially given that our students and families are not able to, to go anywhere right now either, right? So just to sort of put that out there and have that conversation, I think would be uh, something for the board to take up in support of the educators in the system. Thank you very much, Jen. Um, if I might uh, just note we're at the eight o'clock mark, and um, this is vitally important. This is really the core of what we're all about. Um, but we should perhaps be mindful of time and the finiteness of attention spans and um, uh, life force in general. Um, may I go back to Deborah's request? And if I could try to paraphrase it without mangling it, I hope. Um, the idea is to give the superintendent and leadership team the latitude to work with teachers with the association in order to set up a mode of work, in order to put together the, um, the approach to this continuity of learning over the course of this week. Did I get that more or less correctly, Deborah? Yes, and uh, as I said, we don't have um, a fully articulated plan. Um, we've had several um, proposals and some extensive conversations, but we weren't able to wrap that up in a way that was going to meet everyone's needs before this evening's meeting. So uh, we're going to take it back up again tomorrow. And I would be more than happy to speak with um, perhaps to you, Scott, or with our leadership, um, our board leadership team to check in with you once we've coalesce this idea and and just to be sure that you know if, if you would um, if a leadership team from the board would be comfortable with that with delegating that responsibility and then of course we would uh, need to be sure that our in our parents were informed as soon as possible about um, what that might look like and what that might mean for their students for their children and um, and for their own work sure um we can do that. I, I would welcome the um, the position of board members um, in our full session. If uh, Lindy has her hand up. Oh, Lindy, yes, please. And I see Mia does as well. I just I have a question about well, pretty specifically. I don't think we're trying to micromanage how the teachers are getting this work done with Deborah. And it feels like she's asking our permission for um, working with teachers next week, which I think is more at the leadership team level as far as in this situation of what they're doing and how they're getting it done. And I wouldn't want to get in the way of that as a board. Um, I think my, thank they you need very to much. The reason my, for my asking uh, is because we um, we don't have a time blocked out in our school calendar for this coming week for in-service or teacher planning time. We are, um, it is listed as instructional time. And while we are still in the maintenance mode, um, what I've observed and heard uh, is acceptable from others in the around the state and from the AOE to, to scale back the student contact to allow the teachers to focus on the work, the long-term work. And that's what we definitely wish to do next week. I don't have an exact schedule. I know it's something that other superintendents around the state have done, um, but I feel as I feel that you need to be aware before you receive a copy of our letter uh, or a phone call from a community member that this is what we're doing and why. I think that Jen's um, report gave built a strong case for not only what needs to be accomplished, but the time that'll be required to accomplish it. So we are all in agreement about that. It's just the exact structure or schedule has yet to be completed. Thank you, Deborah. Mia? Um, my question isn't relevant to that topic, so I'm gonna hand it to Diane. Diane has her hand up. Yes. Diane. I have a, a bigger question and I'm not sure where the discussion lies. Um, so I absolutely, I hear what you're saying, Deborah, about the teaching 
and the teacher's time, I guess I would like to have a better understanding of how we are addressing um, the needs of all of our staff and, and ensuring the work of all of our staff. And so I'm curious as to when that part of the conversation um, might also come into play so that we have a better understanding of what's happening in all of our buildings. Well, right now we're talking about teachers across the district in all the buildings and we have um, uh, some, you know, very common structures in place at U32 because of the fact that that school is a single building. Um, as was discussed, we're now looking at how we can support teachers to identify what's essential to be taught. And to us, it's extremely important that we have a common agreement about what our essential expectations are for students between now and year's end. One example that I used earlier today in speaking with some of our teachers was that if we were to permit every sixth grade teacher to make their own decisions about what might be essential in math, for example, um, we will have five different graduating classes of sixth grade students coming to the middle school uh, who may have had some very different experiences at the conclusion of this year. And that transition will be all the harder for them if we aren't able to find the time to bring, to, to gather our staff together and um, allow them to assist us in making common levels of agreement. Um, so that's just one example of why the need is there. Um, we are, uh, we love the fact that our schools are very different and we've, there's um, a lot of opportunity for creativity and, um, but in terms of what we teach and that I think is something that we have to reach agreement on across our schools in particular in the primary core content areas. But I'm, I would be happy to hear from other administrators and their thoughts on that. Um, before we do, may we just go to Chris, please? Thank and you. then Jill. Um, okay. And then Jill. Well, I'm going to defer to Jill. And then I'll... Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to say I totally support Deborah's proposal if she thinks she needs our okay or at least a heads up for the staff to, you know, take. It sounds like what you're asking for is to take a little breath and do some planning at a time when you wouldn't normally be doing planning because the world has changed so much. I'm fully in support of that. And, um, I, you know, this is this time is so stressful. There's this is this unprecedented moment where everyone is stressed. There is no one who isn't stressed at this moment, no matter what their role is. And so everybody needs more time and more space and fewer expectations, no matter what they're doing. So I'm fully in support of your proposal. Thanks, Joe. Chris? Yeah. Uh, so, Deborah. Um, is this a proposal for all of the teachers um, to yes. basically have their attention reallocated or redirected? That's what the leadership yes. team. That's what the leadership team believes is necessary, and I support that. Okay, um, just I'm just asking fact questions. And so, yeah. will there be uh, no teacher contact next year, next week? Does that mean no key teacher contact with students next week? Well, that's a Does detail that mean we have. No yeah, teacher contact I, with. I got it the second time. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the um, I think that's what we need right. to that's what we need to work out and address. There's not been. Um, I don't have a full schedule. I can say that there are schools in our state that are taking that tact. This is considered a maintenance period, which we've discussed, as opposed to a con continuity learning period this coming week. So we feel that mm -hmm. between the work that is prepared and sent home this week um, with the communication to parents that our teachers are otherwise engaged in planning so that the following week we can initiate our new long-term uh, remote learning plan uh, is, is what we're asking. And I know it is uh, it's unusual, but there's so much about this whole process that's been unusual. Um, we feel that we feel we truly need our teachers. Uh, we feel our teachers need the time. They've asked us for the time. And the more well organized and structured we can be and clear about our expectations, I think the easier it'll be for our students and for our families. So, Deborah, are you essentially looking at having next week as a kind of 
pseudo Easter break and then picking up after? Well, the um, we had talked about moving the Easter break uh, or winter, excuse me, spring break, so as not to maintain a religious connotation, sorry. Uh, but we've been told that we should maintain a spring break. Um, many of our teachers have reported that they would like to have a time that where they are down. Um, we spoke about possibly changing the break, but remember, all of our families are working at home. Um, all of the surrounding schools uh, where our teachers are living are going to be uh, having a break during the week of April 20th. If we shift our break, it's going to create a dissonance with other schools in this in the region so that families who are working with us with children will not, um, they'll be out of sync. Uh, so there's so many variables to this, as you can tell, just by every question is raised. I mean, this could be a, you know, a couple of day long conversation, but we're trying the best we can to sort it out and, and to do what's going to be the least disruptive while ensuring that we're prepared to implement this um, major undertaking for the remainder of the year. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I, Keith is pointing out to me that there is a comment from Kate um, that we need to maintain contact with our students. And I noticed that Jonas also has his hand up. I, I, so I think I speak for most of us, you know, we totally support, take the time that you need, do the planning. I also agree with Kate that, you know, some contact, you know, maintaining contact with students is important. Um, you know, my kid heard from his teacher, you know, uh, by video uh, uh, for the first time, maybe today, the days are running together. Um, but I think it's, it's absolutely essential. Um, you know, I had another comment, but I, but, but I lost it. Um, oh, um, extending the spring break, I think would not be a great idea. Um, we're all, every one of us is turned upside down, adding another week you know, where there's, I mean, I'm having a hard time finding things for my kids to do that's not Netflix, right? And having, I mean, even the worksheets, right? Even the maintenance stuff is something. Thanks, Jonas. So um, shall we approach it this way? Are there any objections to uh, Deborah's um, request provided that some contact with students is maintained. It's okay? Well, how would yeah. the, Scott, how would the contact be maintained? How would the contact be maintained? That would be up to the teachers, I would imagine. Well, and so we, is there, Deborah, is there a possibility of that? Just because if, if all the teachers are gonna be involved in the planning, then, um, doesn't sound like there's opportunity or time for maintaining contact with students. So, oh, you know, I, I guess in terms of um, providing providing expectations for families, we should be pretty clear about what will or, mm -hmm. or will not be available. I completely right. think there's an, a reality here that we should be operating out of. Right, and I think there's a couple of things that have been raised tonight that point out um, just how very dedicated our teachers are and their desire to maintain ongoing connection and contact with their students. Um, and Mia is here and she might want to address, you know, the kind of outreach that she's received. But I can say that um, every teacher I've spoken with, and there have been many um, through committees and people who have just reached out to offer ideas and suggestions, um, they are, um, 100% engaged in working with their students right now. Um, they are in, including phone calls because as we said, we do have some students who don't have internet uh, and we have students with special needs. We have intervention teachers who are looking to try to support students who have special programs and plans. Um, I think that there's a lot of desire to, to on our part to try to help our teachers understand exactly, you know, collectively what our responsibilities are so that we don't find ourselves in the three to four weeks from now with a whole staff of burned out teachers. I truly have that concern. Um, 
I'm not really answering your question exactly, but I'm, I'm just trying to illustrate for you that I think our teachers are, are um, extending themselves and I think that we need to make a long-term plan that's reasonable and that we need to incorporate ways to reach everyone um, as well, which at this point has not been a part of our conversation. I'd, I know that our teachers would say, I don't wanna take this time. I know that there are several who said, I don't wanna stop, but there are just as many who have so much need for time collectively, in particular, those individuals who haven't had an opportunity to work together, such as our first grade teachers and our sixth grade teachers and our special educators who are working on IEPs, they need time. They have to pause what they're doing in order to accomplish that. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to point out, there are a couple of interesting comments uh, in the chat box from Jody and Lisa. Um, Jody, why can't the paras help with contacting students since at least in EMES, there is a para in every room at some point and know the kids? And Lisa says, at the elementary level, there are paras that I believe would have time to contact children for the next week. Um, so just pointing out, I guess, uh, a resource available. Lisa um, from Berlin. We have talked about that too. And that's what I was saying. I, was, I had hoped to have a, a fully developed plan, uh, but while we had some several conversations, um, we've not, our leadership team has not reached agreement with most recent proposals that were, uh, we tried to formulate that were, were, um, were brought forward and we just need another day to do that. And I'm confident we'll be able to. And this feedback and is very helpful. <clears throat> Chris, did you ask any more? Is there is there any uh, just is there anything in the um, teacher contract that is a, that pro provides any type of obstacle or something to work around in in terms of moving forward the way you proposed? Well, we have a certain number of instructional days and in service days that are set up, and we have basically exhausted our in service days, with the exception of a, a half day or a full day at the end of the school year. Uh, so. We, you know, one option would be to reschedule that. We can reschedule any days that are available, but we're really talking about adding time in the planning mode, not reducing the amount of contact time or the amount of work time for teachers. It's just how it's scheduled, and it's it is something that our union has to agree with. It's a it's a negotiated item. It's a work day, work year, working condition related our, uh, item, which we cannot unilaterally change. And um, we've had great positive okay. conversations about what all the options are. We just haven't found um, that direct linked path yet, which we will. I'm confident we can. <laughs> it almost sounds like you're, you're trading instructional time for planning time. In a sense, during maintenance of learning, which is, you know, again, considered a lower level of instructional time by the state in this new world that we're working within at this time. Right. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Jonas, did, did you have something further? <clears throat> Lindy had her hand raised. Lindy. Um, I was thinking because this is unprecedented, so the contract might not say it. In the past, snow days have been turned into teacher days at the end of the year sometimes because they just have been. It has happened. And I'm wondering if it couldn't be looked at as these are make up snow days for teachers if there's some issue about how many PD days are in an actual contract. That is something that has happened in the past. Um, so if it was considered a PD day, the way you're talking about it, and the association had issues, that might be a way of showing what's been done in the past maybe not the near past, but it has been done and it's been done across the state where the last day of school might end up being a teacher day instead of a kid day because it falls on a Monday and why run the buses again, get your number that's of days. A, that's a great idea. And I also understand that there's been some times when those days have been forgiven uh, as well in the past. But I, they, as recently as last year, several of them were turned into um, professional development days because we had such a large number of um, snow or weather event days. 
Mm -hmm. So yes. we'll take that back as well and, and consider that. Thank you. A couple of more um, comments on the subject in the chat box from Diane uh, about what, somewhat related, will this impact the number of days that will need to be made up since it's not a student day? And then Ellen, we have more student days than most schools in the area. I know this is due to length of day, but what does that even mean anymore? So we have we have 175 minimum days. Um, our calendar includes 180 days. Then we also have a contingency of five additional days or up to five days in the event of a snow or a weather event. Um, recently, the guidance from the governor is that uh, we don't need to request waivers as long as our students are in session for 175 days. That for in this particular year, under these circumstances, that's acceptable. So we do have some flexibility as Lindy was describing. Very good. Um, and Floor, I'm very happy to see, has figured out a way to kick me under the table, even at a distance, um, <laughs> reminding me oh, that, <laughs> reminding me that um, we still have more to go on the COVID-19, but we also would like to just at least touch on the memo that was shared with the board. Um, for, for the rest, I don't want to, I promised Diane I wouldn't give COVID-19 short shrift, and yet um, we still have uh, health and technology and um, social emotional learning, well, health, SEL, technology, facilities, childcare, and finance. Um, uh, what I'd like to do, if there's no objection, is to um, perhaps give them somewhat short shrift. Uh, ask if there's any, uh, any burning issue in any of those domains that the board needs to take care of and perhaps uh, give them some um, time to check in in more detail at our next meeting. Um, unless I get, unless I get uh, a, an uproar of outrage from my, my colleagues on the board. Um, I, would just like to, I would just like to first thank all of our team leaders in the even if they don't have a chance to speak with you this evening and and bring one topic to your attention in the area of child care. Um, this is a more of a FYI for the board. Um, we are at one point we were required uh, and compelled to provide child care. Then it was um, a voluntary for our staff. Uh, now it's voluntary for us to even provide child care. So it's just so interesting how things change over time. We are still operating our child care this week and in communication with Kim, our numbers are dwindling. And I'd like to inform you that we may suspend our program uh, after Friday until additional increased demand comes forward, in which case we could re reinstate it. Um, it seems with one or two students that it's not a, the best use of our staff's time and resources, but I think that when, um, as time goes on, it's likely we will have more increased demand. So that's the only update I have for that. And I know that there were some finance items um, as well, um, but I don't know if that's something that, Lori, you feel the need to address at this time or another night. Mary Lynn has a, her hand up, Scott. Um, so I, my only question was ab about the childcare because I was obviously as I'm essential, I'm, a, I'm aware of that shift. Um, and just wondering, not, not in detail what the contingency plan would be for those families that still need it, um, but just wondering what collaboration we are gonna do so that those, those of us that would potentially need it um, have access to that. Sure, so if we were to stop, we, we have lists of people who are either saying we may need it later or we're currently needing it. And the very small number of people we would not close if we did not, if they did not have an alternative um, location because we do understand that they're essential. So thank you for mentioning that, Marilyn. I appreciate it. Indeed, thanks. Um, and I, I'm, Hearing from um, from Amy and Keith and Kat, um, 
And I, I ask that all of you who have questions on social emotional learning and health to email Kat at her, um, at her U32 address as Keith for technology. And um, Jonas's question to, um, to Keith uh, is, is definitely a very interesting one. So um, shall we then, uh, sorry, let me get oriented again. Shall we then, uh, Fleur, take a look at that, um, Fleur Jonas, take a look at that document that you drew up? If I may, Scott, um, there, yes, were, there were a few things that the board had asked us to report on in relation to finance um, in advance of this meeting. And we, if you wish, if you wouldn't mind going back to that at some point to collect questions so that Lori and I can gather that information and answer questions that you may not, if we don't know the answers this evening, we could definitely research it for you. So excuse me for interrupting, but that was on, on our uh, list of to-dos for tonight. Um, quite right. Uh, and perhaps uh, if I might just mention, if Kari, uh, if you can hear me, um, after we talk about this memo, uh, I know you've been doing a lot of thinking about the financial side of this. If you have, uh, if you'd like to maybe launch some of those questions um, over dinner, of course. Bon appétit. <laughs> um, so, uh, Fleur, Jonas, would you like to uh, tackle the memo? Yes, that that'll be great. I just realized that not everybody has the the memo because we sent a, shared it with you sent it to the board, but I know we have a lot of administrators on the line. So, are it, do you want me to send that around quickly so they can see it too, or want, should we just do it as the board? If you'd like since to they will be receiving it tomorrow first. If you want to send I, it to me, I, I can get it to the teams. Uh, list I believe first. I believe Scott shared it with you, oh, you did. Deborah. Okay. I'll just have to go back to my email yeah. and find it. <laughs> uh, it could okay. be shared on the screen. That's true. How, how do I do that? I have it open, but I don't know. How do I share on the screen? The green share button. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, one minute. Let me see, share button. So I don't know if you guys had the opportunity to, to read a host disable attendee screen sharing, it says to me. Okay, but I'm going I to think that you guys you. had a- Hold on, I can, I can enable it. Give I'm, me I'm one just, minute. I'm just going to get into the leadership. There you go, for. You have okay. it? Okay, there we Thank go. Thank you. So, so how do I know it? So you just put it on the top of my board. Just click on the one you want to see. Okay. You'll see two in front of you. Yeah. Ah. Do you see it or not yet? No. Yeah. Um, Laura, mine is open it if you want me to share it. Yeah, why don't you share it? Because mine is kind of back, maybe because it's a Mac, I'm not sure, but. Do you mind sharing it, Lynn? There. there we go. There we go. There you go. So if you guys had a chance, and Jonas, please jump in. If you guys had a chance to read this uh, before the meeting, I know that we send it late. Basically, we wanted to, to send a, a message since the governor announced last week, we haven't been able to, to really write to the staff. And uh, we all felt like uh, as your sort of leadership team from the board, that something should go out. So I don't know if you have any particular questions or should we point you out at some important pieces of it? Or are you comfortable with this being shared with the staff? I know Scott had comment that it felt a little bit long. I can't really figure out any piece of it that I wanna cut, but, <laughs> but you know, we're open for input. Should I scroll uh, down? Sure. Yes, please. Uh, the only, the only comment I had was on that we are committed to paying all of our employees through this most challenging school year. Um, and then we will honor our contracts. I, I'm concerned that that first sentence, I don't want it to be misconstrued. 
so it's in my mind is different to say we will honor all our contract and uphold our commitments i think is very appropriate okay committed to paying all our employees so does that mean no matter what we're going to pay them for the rest of the year whether they do anything or not i think we should be open to that yeah if some people can't work that might not necessarily be our fault and i would not want to punish them i think that we should err on the side of continuing to employ people regardless of the challenges that we may have in finding work for them at least through this contract year so my concern is for administrators that now we don't want to empower employees to say i can't work and tell an administrator or supervisor i'm sorry i can't work um i have too much at home and expect to be paid i'd like to make a recommendation if i may excuse me um might we put this topic aside uh, for a conversation later on this evening? I, I want to be sure that we are uh, uh, contractual conversations, conversations about possible negotiated negotiations to our current agreement are really uh, the kinds of things that would be eligible for executive session. Um, so that would be my suggestion. That particular topic, not the letter as a whole, um, but that's my suggestion and you're welcome to agree or disagree. I, I just have a comment. I think I, I'm, I'm okay uh, taking the, the, the first bold sentence, but I think that that we have to make a statement. I, I am, you know, but maybe I'd be more of a dreamer, but I, I, I've been with the staff for a long time and I know our community. And I think what the, this, the purpose of this paragraph really, as we were drafting it, it, it was more about empowering people to know that you know like i don't think anybody in this board wants to be in the place of judging people for showing up not showing up getting sick or not getting sick we we said it about the bus drivers that we were gonna you know pay them it's all about you know telling people that we are gonna uphold our commitments that we made with them at the beginning of of the year and i think people will be more likely to to do more rather than than less it, that's just that's just me so if that paragraph needs to be rephrased in a in a different way that wouldn't uh, get us uh, legally uh, i i think it's conflict. a question we have to address though i mean i think this yeah. letter loses its power if we don't address as to whether or not what we are saying is we are going to pay you um and that we're going to assure you of that so i yeah. think um if it needs to move this needs to be moved to executive session, then I think that needs needs to happen. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree that it should be discussed, but I also think it should be discussed in executive session. Um, I think the letter is way too long. I actually find it really stressful to get any long correspondence right now as someone who's working really hard on this crisis. And I, I just don't think anybody needs to read long letters. I don't think you need to do any of that, like the long-term planning, all the goals of the, I don't think you need any of that in a letter ask, telling people that we, we're supporting them. In some ways, to me, it actually kind of um, uh, it adds stress because it's sort of saying, well, even though it's a crazy time, we're going to do everything we said. So I would take all of that out myself. Mia has, Mia has raised her hand, Scott. Mia has raised her hand. Great. I, I can't see I didn't anybody. <laughs> um, Mia, please. It might have been Mia. there for some time. Oh, Mia. I guess my question was from yeah. a while ago. Oh. It doesn't matter. Well, it, well it, we'd like to hear it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sorry to derail the conversation a little bit, but um, I just have a question back from Jen. I guess I'll turn to the sales and then I try to do it in here, but I don't know if I think that would be more helpful to talk about later rather than right now while we're talking about this in the um, I, I didn't, I didn't quite make that out completely. Floor, floor you've got to mute while Mia speaks. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Should I, um, my that question should. was, Jen was talking, uh, I was wondering about how transferable skills 
were being assessed and about graduating seniors and their graduating proficiencies. So I don't know if that would be more helpful to talk about at a later time rather than right now while everybody's talking about the math. Does that make sense? Yeah, what do you think? M me? What do I think? Uh, I, I guess, uh, um, Deborah, when, when would be a good time in this meeting to address the question of, tr of proficiencies and, um, and the, the situation of seniors? I don't know if we have, as a leadership team, had the opportunity to fully explore that and would be prepared to speak to you about it with, um, I think that there's further research. I know myself personally that I'm expecting guidance. I said that so often lately, I sound like a broken record, but the Agency of Education has promised us some guidance on end of year uh, calendaring, all of those things. Um, and it should be coming out within this week. Um, I'm expecting that information. I think that will help inform us and, and enable us to respond more uh, knowledgeably. I, I know that I, I can certainly Im imagine the um, questions that every senior has. And uh, I, you know, again, if Stephen or um, Jen have had this discussion, you know, in um, meetings with the faculty, I would welcome you to just step in and offer whatever you have discussed up to this point, but um, my understanding it's still decisions, final decisions are still uh, under development. Good. Um, Mia, uh, uh, can you wait? Well, so, so here's what, Scott, I'll offer um, real Thank quickly. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. So, um, so we are working feverishly, not really fevered, but we are working hard. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, sorry. Um, so, so we're working hard to get this um, to you, Mia, as soon as possible. Um, we've been in contact with a bunch of the other schools, and we're talking to them about what's, um, you know, what are we all uh, looking at? What are we? What are the possibilities? Um, we know that this information needs to get out our, to our seniors soon. Um, so we're we're putting that together. We're hoping to get it out by the end of this week. Um, so that there's clarity about what the seniors will need to do. And it, it, we should have at least a start to the statement for you. Great, thank you, Steve. I knew it was being worked on. I just, you know, we don't want to make, I didn't want to make any assumptions that it was ready to go. So thanks. Does that make you feel a little better, Mia, hopefully? Yes. Great. Yeah, was, my friend and I were talking. Great, thank you very much. So um, we'll, uh, We'll leave the memo for now, and we'll be returning to it essentially when we get back into um, we deal with issues in executive session. Is that everybody okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Super. Um, Scott, it's yes. Lindy. Hi, Lindy. Um, in in the chat, there's a chat about people taking sick leave. I don't know if that's yes. going to be discussed in the executive session or not, but. Um, I would like clarification on that at some point. Yes, indeed. I, I, I sent Jody a note um, in the chat uh, just signaling that it would be our intention to take that up as in the context of the executive session discussion so that we can find out more what, what's going on with that. Um, okay. Can we add something to that? Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, Whoever that is. Cat. Oh, Cat. Cat. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to point out, I had said the social emotional committee and the health committee did need to report out tonight, but um, I want just to really strongly remind all of us that all of our staff um, is under an enormous amount of stress. I think our fears are rising and our tempers are as well and our patience is getting really low. And all of our educators, at, on our entire school community, they need to get their basic needs met and having some guarantees or reassurances is incredibly important right now. Yes. Um, I know that you all care and you're trying to, to do that from all of our, your base, your uh, various roles and responsibilities. Just wanna make sure that's front and center, not just for our students and our families, but for our staff as well. Thank you, Kat. Well said. 
Okay. Scott. Yes, Marilyn. I know I asked this before, but um, do we have EAP available to staff yes. right now? Okay. Yes, thanks. we do. Thank you for asking. Good. Um, all right. Are we ready then to move on to 5.0, board, board operations? Remember, um, we, we passed on the finance topic, but it's up to the board whether you want to address those, try to gain questions or postpone that until another meeting. Um, if I, oh, God, you're right. Yes, my apologies. And Kari, meanwhile, has been thinking about his questions over his dinner. Um, uh, Kari, would you like would you like to um, sort of launch the the investigation? Um, actually, no. I, I don't. I don't know that this is necessarily the right time. I just. I guess what I would raise for the board, um, and may, many of you have probably thought about this, but uh, added to the list of all the things that we need to think about, to be concerned about is is the possibility that next year's budget um, may be in flux for us. And um, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of our, um, you know, what, what the legislature ends up doing with the state education funding, and then um, what our community's ability to pay their tax um, rates are, are going to be. And there's more that we don't know than we do know. And I know folks that are monitoring the legislature um, know that that's a, that's a discussion that's happening at that level. Um, but I think it's something that we need to be in tune with. And I would I would suggest two things. One is that we we do pay attention to what's happening in the legislature. So we have a sense of where that's heading. And two is that the finance committee give that some thought in case we need to make um, um, adjustments next year. And so I just wanted to raise that concern and, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Is there any um, any sort of counterpoint that you, Deborah, or Lori would like to make to what Kari just said? Well, I can say that we're asking these questions that you've raised both now and in your previous um, email communication, Kari. So uh, of the Agency of Education and um, we uh, know that we anticipate that there will be more information made available to business managers at their next meeting, which is a week from Friday. Uh, we don't know if all of the answers to those questions will be available at that time, but we, we are really waiting and we're, we see guidance two to three times a week on these topics. And um, as you know, we are all, uh, I think, experiencing the same level of discomfort and that you have uh, addressed. Lori, if you would like to add anything, please do so. Um, just to say that the, um, the big questions I have are with regard to reimbursements and are we going to be shorted this year for having, for instance, special ed parents delivering food? Are we going to be shorted for our bus contract? Um, I don't have those answers, but I'm putting together a list just like I think Carrie and, and you, Scott, had identified. I, I am wondering how many revenues we're going to lose this year by changing the deployment of staff. Which has to do with revenue received for work, not, um, not because they aren't working. In particular, it's because of how they're working or what they're assigned to. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I yeah. guess one, one question I'm wondering about that might be helpful is there's going to be a lots of additional costs for things that we didn't anticipate, obviously, working toward breaking down some of those opportunity gaps that we have for our children. But I wonder, too, where are the things that we're not having to that uh, cost savings, so to speak? So we know we don't need subs. We know we don't we're not potentially paying trans, you know, um, mileage. Um, so I'm just curious, too about, because um, it helps to shift our lens because we're not in the usual world. And so I'm just curious um, at some point down the road of, of seeing. And I've been working on that this week and I'm continuing to work with the school of men assistants and the principals and trying to put together that list. Um, so we will be compiling it and there are gonna be additional costs with the COVID situation. You're absolutely correct. Thank you very much, everyone. Are, are we ready to move then into 5.0?
knowing that we will be shown us. But I just want to say one thing, there are going to be tough choices to make, and, you know, Lori, I don't envy you your job, but I hope that as we are making financial decisions as we go forward, that we are doing it with an eye toward not increasing, but rather mitigating the human suffering in our community and supporting people where we can. I do not want us to be penny wise and pound foolish and cause more damage um, than is already being done. Thank you. Okay, 5.0, ready? Um, I do believe if, I, uh, if I'm looking at this correctly, that I would entertain a motion to approve the school calendar for 2020 to 2021 as presented. Would anyone care to make such a motion? So moved. Floor moves. I'll second. Was that Lindy? It was. Lindy seconds. Thank you. Uh, discussion of the motion. I would just like to point out that because of the interruption in our typical operations, our leadership team hasn't had an opportunity to come back and provide you with more detailed information about um, our preferred correctional development time and whether it will be early release as was previously um, included in our calendar or monthly at, with a, approximately a half day. Uh, so we do intend to do that. We're not ready this evening, but I felt that it was important that the calendar be adopted so we could inform our families about our schedule for next year. And then we can make that update um, hopefully within the month. Okay. Um, thank you, Deborah. Other discussion? Questions? I have a really silly and newbie question to ask that I finally got the answer to why we have more calendar days than necessary tonight. That was like the, a great aha moment for me. Um, but as we discuss, maybe I, I, I believe recently we've talked about the change in um, our schedule, our, our school days, et cetera, et cetera. So if we move on to continue that conversation over the year, then that would be reflected in the next year's calendar approval? Is that how that would work? Well, this calendar really looks at days. Um, and the one thing that's important to point out is that we must align our instructional, 175 of our instructional days with the regional tech center, which is the Barry Tech Center. Right, okay. Um, so we, we, we can, starting back in December, we begin a conversation about that amongst the superintendents that share that tech center region, um, but we can't deviate specifically from that without causing us to be out of sync, and that's a, a, a state statute requirement that we have. Um, but when it comes to hours in the day or, um, early release, those are things that the board can do without interfering with how many days that we, and when the days are scheduled. And so that's why I'm referencing that as a later conversation. Does that get to your question, Mary Lynn, or did you have? Um, yeah, kind of, I think, yeah, I think so. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Because you're on the camera. Um, so if there, uh, are there any more questions? Otherwise, we can go to a vote. And once again, uh, elected board members only, please um, click yes for, uh, for voting yes on the motion to approve the calendar for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, and no, if you, if you don't, uh, if you're voting against, that motion. Wait, where does the clicking happen? I'm sorry. Oh, um, if you if you click on the participants um, mm -hmm. uh, icon oh, no, at the I bottom, got it. That's you got it. Great. I got it. Thank Excellent. You. Yeah, I should ask Jael to give these instructions. She's the one who instructs me. So, so I am seeing only green yeses. Um, so I shall then declare the motion 
past. Thank you, everyone. And, and I guess um, if you click yes again, it erases your vote so, so that you live to vote again. Um, all right. Uh, we are now on committee reports. Uh, and the first of, of these is negotiations. Jonas? <laughs> yeah, um, so we concluded our negotiations with the, uh, with the Teachers Association, um, and we are looking forward to uh, negotiations with the support staff. Um, we, uh, what the, the union negotiators and our committee wanted to put together and wanted to express this joint statement. Uh, that the union and the district expressing mutual respect and solidarity in this time of crisis appreciate each other's willingness to work together to find common solutions that benefit the students, families, and teachers of our district. My only quibble with that is the lack of the serial comma at the end of that sentence, but I think that that accurately represents um, the mood in the room when we finished our last session. Um, we have a tentative agreement um, that for a one-year contract uh, covering next year, given the deep uncertainty that surrounds uh, everything right now, um, we're going to incorporate uh, the merger language that represents the change from supervisory union to school district. Um, we have a tentative agreement on 3.7% of new money. Uh, that also applies to athletics, co-curricular, and department head stipends. Uh, there's also uh, other changes, including uh, an extension of parental leave uh, to eight weeks and an optional leave day for religious observance that will be taken from sick leave. Um, and we are awaiting the union's um, uh, uh, ratification. And I hope that after we discuss this further, uh, tonight, we will um, uh, uh, getting around to voting and approving uh, the, 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 the draft agreement that I think everybody has in their inboxes. And I would just point out that because the union is, has not completed their ratification, which they have informed me they intend to do by midweek, hopefully of next week, that the board motion should state that this approval is contingent upon the teacher's ratification. Great. Um, we don't need to take any action on that statement. That was your committee's statement. That was correct? our committee's statement, yes. Jointly with the association. Yes. Great. Excellent. It's a good one. Um, any questions, board members, for, uh, for Jonas or any other members of the committee? Our, our deep gratitude to you all for getting this done. Pretty amazing, especially under these circumstances. We were fortunate to work with a good group of people on the other side of the table. We're grateful for that as well. Thanks to all. Questions? Or shall we move on to policy? Okay. Policy. Chris, all yours. Chris, you're still muted. Let's see if I can unmute you. Sarah, you must have been reading my lips, but thank you for, <laughs> for telling me that I'm muted. I was reading your lips, yeah. <laughs> um, so we have up for, um, we have up for consideration two policies, B3, uh, alcohol and drug-free workplace, and B20, uh, personnel recruitment, selectment, appointment, and background checks. So, Chris, um, be before you continue, do, do you want a motion yes. to approve those? Um, is that your role as chair, Scott? I, I sometimes. Yes, please, <laughs> please. Okay, uh, who will move to approve the second reading of uh, approve in second reading policies B three and B twenty? Sorry. Uh, Jill, Jill made the motion. Oh, Jill made the motion. Thank you, Jill. Uh, second? I'll second, Mary Lynn. 
Thank you, Marilyn. Great. Um, so, Chris, take her away. Any um, discussion on these? These are back for the second time. Um, I believe we incorporated some language uh, based on our previous discussion. Um, but any any thoughts on? Let's take it with B three. Any um, comments on B three as it is currently formulated? Yes, this is Steve. Let me make sure I'm looking at the right. Okay, yeah, B three. Uh, and I apologize. I'm sure I wasn't on the board the first time through. But in definitions of drugs, the addition of unless prescribed to, to me creates a lot of confusion. Why? Because the definition says a drug is these things. And then you've added unless prescribed. So if that drug is prescribed, then it's no longer a drug. So it's, it, it's not part of this policy. Uh, you know, the intention I think was to take out drugs that are prescribed from being a violation of the policy. I, I, because I, it talks about I, possession, I, use and of, of any drug and, and so that, that was the intent of adding unless prescribed. I, I, understand, I, I understand the intent and I thought it might have been closely related to marijuana. But my, my point is whether uh, an amphetamine is illegal or it's prescribed, if it's influencing what you're doing in the school, then it should be covered by the policy. And by saying we're defining drugs as these things, unless they're prescribed. So if they're prescribed, then they're not a drug under this definition. So therefore they don't fall under this policy. So if I'm a prescribed an amphetamine, I, if I'm under the influence of that amphetamine while I'm working, I'm not covered by this policy. I can work under the influence of an amphetamine as long as it's prescribed. I can work under the influence of marijuana as long as it's been prescribed. Because the way and, this wording is, is, we're saying that is no longer a drug under our definitions because it's been prescribed. I do remember us talking about this, um, Lord, it was so long ago, I don't even know what day today is, but, um, and that question did come up and I, my understanding from the policy committee was there were people potentially um, in trouble because they were taking, um, you know, say they were on an ADHD drug or some other drug that is prescribed, but without this part of it in there, could potentially be in trouble. So I thought it was specifically put in there for people who may need to in order to um, to be present might need one of these drugs prescribed. So that was my understanding of it. Right. And I think, you know, if you are prescribed, we'll use morphine as an example for chronic pain. Um, if you are using that as advised under prescription, then you cannot assume that that person is under an influence and not able to maintain their routine daily activity and be able to carry that out with no um, undue influential effect. And so, yes, that, that is the point of it. I'm trying to pull it up to see, because then we had this conversation about how do we tease out if someone's under the influence or not um, and using it inappropriately, that, that gets money. But we had that conversation. I'm trying to pull up how we address it's, that. Well, what we did, if you look at the two policies that we have, um, we struck the word impairing influence. Right. Um, which is, and, and um, Stephen, you, you're under the influence of a drug if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is reducing chronic pain or addressing um, an attention deficit disorder. It, you, you're being influenced by it. Um, but we were, I think we were worrying about 
using medications that weren't prescribed. And I guess I, my impression is that I don't believe there was other policies that would have addressed if, if an employee or someone else was overusing the prescription medication so that they weren't able to teach um, or do whatever work they were doing because of too much of the medication. Yeah, Jody, I feel like you, I feel like you um, spoke to that when we had this conversation. Do you remember that? I, I don't think there's another policy. What we were, we were trying to address when we would use this policy and it would be when someone was not capable of performing their tasks or duties. So that's what we really focused on is like, this would come into effect when we noticed someone was struggling with their ability to carry out their job. And then I guess the other policy that maybe Chris is referring to would be around supervision and, and making sure that people are performing their essential duties. So I, 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 this is Steve again, I understand that discussion. But the way this is worded, if someone is under a prescribed drug that's legally prescribed, then they cannot be removed from the workplace, could not be immediately removed from the performance of their duties. And that's what the intent of this policy is. If someone's under the influence of drugs or alcohol, whether they're prescribed or not, if it's influencing their ability to work, then they can be removed from the performance of their duties. Got it. Okay. So, so maybe the modifying language would be for the policy um, is if an a prescribed medication is impairing an individual's ability to perform their duties, this policy applies. Well, I, I think, think we have to be careful of some of the language because, um, you know, there might be a time period where someone's getting used to a, a new medication. I guess to me what it's um, part of what might help with that is if a person is overusing what's been prescribed, then they're not following the prescription anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if that's where the caveat is, is that if I have a staff person who's, who's struggling and it appears then I'm going to have that conversation and I might hear some of the ways to support. So then we get at what the root cause of is the inability to get your job done. And then part of that, so then they would be at fault or potentially at fault of violating this if they are using the prescription in the wrong way because they're no longer using it as prescribed. That's what that says to me. I'm just trying to interpret this from an employee point of view. Mm -hmm. And it's what this tells me, um, if I'm prescribed an amphetamine, um, then that is no longer a drug. So regardless of my performance, I can't be removed from my uh, performance of duties because I'm not taking a drug. In our own definition, we've said if something's prescribed, it's no longer a drug. So I come to work, uh, you know, uh, under the influence of something, it's impacting my work, but it's prescribed, so it's it, that's not a drug. You can't remove me from my work. So is there, um, I mean, Diane's point about saying using the medication as prescribed, if an employee or anyone else is using uh, a prescribed medication outside of the prescription or contrary to the prescription, that they would be pulled into this policy, uh, would that address your concerns? I see Jonas's hand up. So I, I was, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Jonas? So um, if someone is unable to successfully perform their job, then their the fact that they have consumed, you know, prescribed marijuana or prescribed morphine is not a get out of jail free card. It doesn't mean that they can't be removed. 
it means that there are other reasons why they should be removed because they are objectively not doing their job. There are other policies and other procedures for removing people from the execution of their jobs based on poor performance, right? That have nothing to do with drugs. Is that administrators? Yes, and those can take I mean, time. So you're looking at this is Steve, I apologize, I'm jumping in. The key word is immediately removed. May I suggest that this might be one that the policy committee might wish to return to their committee for further discussion rather than um, moving yeah. ahead with approval? Yes, in the interest of time, it sounds like a I would, I would propose that as well and bring it back next time to just to address this concerns so that uh, an employee who is on prescription medication is not shielded from being unable to do their work. Is that the goal? I would say it's not shielded. Okay. I, I think what I'm hearing, Stephen, so is not being shielded from being, a, being removed immediately if right. they are so impaired that, they, yes but it's the immediate removal. So he's not comforted by other policies that allow for removal because of um, performance because they are not immediate. I, th I think is how I'm right. I, I would just ask, you know, okay. so yeah. I feel like we already talked about. I mean, what about, a, you know, what about a teacher who's having, you know, an acute mental crisis, right? Who are, or who hasn't slept in two days and is stumbling around the classroom, but is not intoxicated we can't immediately remove that person? No? That's a good point. I, that's I mean, I, I see Stephen not I shaking in the yeah. well, when, we, when we say remove, you can remove someone, but, but not terminate their employment. You could remove them from their position and investigate the situation and all of those things. Uh, that's So that's just so that we're clear when we talk about removal. You're shaking your head, so you agree with me, Stephen? <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's exactly it. If, if we felt that somebody was not capable of doing the job, we could remove them and then we go through normal disciplinary procedures and investigations to figure out what the problem is. But they would be immediately removed from the classroom. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, Chris, do you, yeah. uh, do you want to go with a friendly amendment to sure. um, just to remove B3 and, and stick with B20? Yes, that would be great. We can do that. And we'll bring back B3 next time. Okay. Can, okay. So now, so now uh, we have B20. Can I just add one thing? I, sure. I'm the newcomer here. If everyone was satisfied with the policy as, as it's presented there, uh, and I'm not, you can vote and everyone can say, yeah, they're okay with it. And I'll say I'm not, and it becomes policy. I mean, we don't I, need to have a 100% agreement. No, but it's worth... Um, I, I agree with you, Stephen. <laughs> yes. But it's the, worth looking if, if it looks like there's a, a, a flaw to address it. So yeah, you, do uh, have a, you do have a motion on the table, and so one possibility might be for a member to call the question if in regard to Stephen's suggestion, just to see where the rest of the board stands, if I may be so bold as to offer a parliamentary solution uh, or that that motion could be withdrawn right uh, yeah um there i think uh, chris I, um I, I guess i would defer to chris i i'll withdraw the motion if chris would is you, you know wants yep. to vote thinks we should just go ahead and vote. but if you feel like you want to take it back then i'll withdraw the motion um i would i would like to take it back and okay i would like look to at it. I would like to withdraw my motion. Okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, so we need, uh, in that case, another motion for policy B20. Jill, would you like to float that one? Sure, I got in so much trouble on the last one. <laughs> Not at all. I move that we approve uh, the policy B B20 as presented by the policy committee. I second. 
Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Excellent. And, and, and Chris? I would propose that we, yeah, I would propose that we mute Stephen's microphone um, so for our discussion in this policy. Uh, but no, any, any changes, any changes on this policy that um, as it's been, it comes back to you folks? We incorporated the changes from our, our previous discussion. Uh, you'll look on page two under recruitment, um, under paragraph two. Uh, Chris, this, this is Kari. I, um, I had suggested that change and I appreciate, I appreciate this. It gets at what I was trying to describe. My only concern with this is the word annual, um, annual basis, the administration will participate in a training. Um, while it's good to be specific sometimes that that seems like it might be too specific and might be you know requiring something of the administration that that you know five years from now just doesn't seem like the right frequency so you know, my suggestion would be something like periodic or regular or or something along those lines um how about every at least every two years because if you say periodic or regular who knows what that means and it, let me add, Deborah, is that, is that language difficult for, is this something the administration does anyway, annually? I'm, I'm all right with the language. Does anyone have a, anyone else have a concern? Um, I have a concern just in the sense of, if it says annual, there's not a training available, somebody picks at it, but, uh, something more specific than regular might make sense. About every two years. Substituting least, every, yeah. two, every two years for on an annual. Any comments? So what you, what you mean is every two years instead of on an annual basis, correct? Right. Okay. Yes. So every two years we substitute for on an annual basis. So we, every two years, the administration will participate. And then are the policy, is the policy committee going to be the annual, the every two year police? I think that's a board duty. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> yeah. You would ask for a report about it. I would I would recommend. Ask for a report? Mm -hmm. Ask administration for a report. Well, how about if we put every two years, the administration will report on its participation. That would make sense. On its participation in a training to avoid implicit bias and have the rest continue. Okay. Bill has her hand up. Oh, yeah, I had a comment too, Chris. I think I raised this the last time too, which was you added a sentence I like, the board and number two, the board actively seeks diverse candidates, but you left in the next sentence, which was number four minority applicants in accordance with this policy pertaining to non-discrimination. So I had issues with both the term minority, which seemed really dated, and then also the idea that we would only seek diversity to like adhere to our non-discrimination policy. Um, I'm not sure that sentence is necessary anymore, um, given the other change I, that you made. Um, other com board comments, because I'm, I'm fine with striking that sentence. I think you're right, Jill, that the first sentence addresses what the second topic, the second sentence, yeah, the second sentence as well. I agree with Jill because you also say down below that you will be recruiting. Right. So it takes care of it. Okay. That sound any other any objection to striking that sentence? Okay, any other comments? Good. Um, if there are no other comments, 
then we can move to a vote. Once again, board members only, please. Click on yes if you're in favor of policy B20, of approving policy B20 in its second reading, after which it goes into effect with the changes that have been made, um, or no, if you're opposed to it. Ready? Go. Yeah. I'm seeing again only green yeses. So um, the motion carries. The policy B20 is approved. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for the lively discussion. <laughs> Amen. Yes. So, um, so now, uh, Kari, we have the um, Quality Education Committee. Uh, would you like to just give a brief readout of the meeting. Uh, yeah, very briefly, um, we received a report um, from the um, leadership team about the newest improvement planning process and where we are with that, and then went over some data, um, recent data about student learning outcome performance. And then we, um, did some uh, thinking about what our charge might be. And so we're planning on bringing a proposed charge to the board um, in the near future and then um, and discuss our next agenda. So good organizational meeting. Thank you very much, Kari. Yeah, um, it was good. Interesting one. So <clears throat> that brings us to uh, the consent agenda. Now, we've already approved the minutes um, in the early minutes of this meeting before, wh while we had a quorum, but before all the board members had joined. So, um, and I know that 6.2, uh, many of us, if not most, if not all of us, have actually sent in uh, emails on the board orders, but nonetheless, we can, won't hurt to, to get in the habit of doing them in this meeting um, in the public eye, uh, which is how we should be doing them. So I would gladly entertain a motion um, to approve the board orders for, I think it would have been March 18 to uh, April 1st. Am I, would someone, uh, for the amount given, if someone has that readily to hand, um, to make that motion with the I dollar will, amounts, Jonas? I will, I will move to approve the board orders for $464,221.47 and $20,000, 666 dollars and 82 cents, covering the period March 19 to April 1st. Thank you very much. A second? I'll second that. Thanks, Fleur. Um, any discussion, any questions about them? Laurie, was there anything unusual about this or business as usual? Oh. Yes. Um, no, um, we basically are running the checks on the cycle. Um, we may need to run some off cycle um, as we start construction projects this spring. But other than that, everything's business as usual. Great, thank you very much. All right, um, if there are no other questions or, um, or comments, discussion, all in favor, please, once again, board members only, click on your yes or no button. And don't forget that you need to clear your previous vote before taking another one. Yes, quite right. Thank you, thank you Janice. Can, yeah, I'll, I'll do that the next time for you. Ah, thanks, okay. So, um, I'm once again seeing only green circles. So the motion carries, the board orders are approved. Um, next, thank you everyone. Um, next, Set personnel 7.0. Um, may I please have a motion um, to approve the hiring of Hunter Hedenberg or Hedenberg um, 
as physical education teacher at U32 and as a full-time employee for the coming school year. So moved. Thank you, Chris. Second? I'll second it, Lindy. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Um, any, uh, any discussion of this? If not, please, as Jonas reminded us, clear your uh, previous vote. And by clicking, yes, very good. And if you're in favor, board members, click yes. Opposed, click no. <coughs> um, once again, the motion carries, and we have approved the hiring of Hunter Hedenberg as PE teacher. Um, motion to approve Brady Parker as science teacher at U32 for the upcoming school year. So moved. So, moved. <laughs> uh, so floor moves, Jonas seconds. Uh, any discussion? Scott, I would just correct, it's Bradley Parker. The paperclip got in the way, so it's Bradley Parker. <laughs> That happens to me all the time. Thank you, Stephen. Bradley, not Brady, but Bradley Parker. Um, thanks. So with that correction, all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And once again, the motion carries. Thank you very much. And that's really now, the end of an error when we think about it that he's replacing Kathy Topping. So that's just, just yeah. incredible to see that. Yeah, um, that's, uh, he's, he's got serious shoes to fill. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, huh. um, there's always a sad one, which would be a motion to accept Bill Dice's re re resignation. Um, and I might add with regret uh, and thanks for all his work, um, for his presence. Uh, would anyone care to make that motion? No, but I will. <laughs> I, I'm happy to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I still consider Marilyn as, the, as making the motion and Floor <laughs> as seconding. Thank you. Um, any discussion? Oh, Just... Bill, we'll miss you so much. And thank you so much for all your work and dedication. Um, gosh, we'll miss you. Amen. Is Bill on the line? Oh, I thought he was earlier. Did he I know, leave? I thought he was. I just wanted he to- He wasn't, yeah. Oh. oh, okay. Well, well he'll, he'll just, he'll just sorry, have to he watch missed, the recording. Uh, we'll have to pass on all the accolades. Uh, it certainly yeah. has been a pleasure working with Bill and we will miss him. Yeah. Yeah. He's not going so- far. No, he's not, he's not good. He's not going far. We're happy we, to hear that. We demand that he move, you know, not put, not put him on pillar, very least. Yeah, sad to see him go, but happy that he'll be my counterpart next door and we'll still be working together. Uh, that's true. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. That's great. So um, once more, board members, uh, for yes, click yes. For no, click no. And <laughs> Chris, <laughs> he's just the Troublemaker. Yeah. So a protest um, vote. A protest vote. Let the record show that Chris McVeigh voted no. <laughs> Good. Um, so anyway, we have completed the uh, the public part of the agenda. Well, no, no, we haven't. We have future agenda items. Um, is there anything? Um, that needs to be recorded for future agenda item. We, we talked about putting a not losing sight of a, a, the transition for Brian Okaski as part of our discussion That's for next meeting. Very true. The 100 days, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Flora, most definitely, yes. Stephen, did I, did I see you? Stephen had his hand up, yes. I put my hand up. Mika requested an inappropriate time in the 
but couldn't find one to make it. Um, I tend to be about the U32 staff saying what you want, cut it in half and cut it in half again. Um, I, it's hard to hear I, you. I would and... ask that the board, and we won't make a decision tonight, it's too late, but our, our executive committee to not require as many administrators that we have here. I, I know it might put board members out, outside their comfort zone. People still hear me, my in it's going wonky. Yeah, you're going in and out, Stephen. You can Never call it. Yeah. Can you type it into chat? Yeah. Are you asking about Let's just maybe... move on. It's something I'll just do. Okay. Good. All right. Um, any other future agenda items, thoughts, requests? I would ask that we have more realistic time built into the um, agenda for COVID-19 and the response, especially, I mean, 30 minutes, just not that we want to discuss it ad nauseum, but, um, but there's a lot that's happening that staff are working on and will continue to work on. Um, and so it seems a little disrespectful to only have 30 minutes for it. Yeah, I, I think we're trying, yeah. Basically everything, it's a new world and we're kind of feeling our way forward, but understood. Thank you, Diane. Um, okay, so uh, if we're done with future agenda items, then that concludes the, um, the public part of our session. And I think um, we could, should probably continue recording until we go formally into executive session then we can cut the recording. Um, do I have a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations and personnel matters? I'll move. So moved. I'll Jail, second. Um, I, okay, Jaila moved and Chris seconds. Deborah. Just wanted to make a, a comment that the board may have some action on the contract after the executive session. So we will reconvene it into the regular session for that. Um, purpose if the board chooses to do so yeah and I would yeah. I would like to in, I, I would like to invite uh, Lori Jen Kelly Stephen Dellinger Pate and Alicia to our executive session I would like to um, ask to the um, first part yeah could, I yes. would like to ask if the, um, what the purpose of that executive session would be um, with other administrators well, we we are, we are going to be talking. I, my understanding is that we are going to be talking about the, the that number f on the letter, the memo that we were talking about about paras and about contracts. So I I want them to be part of the conversation. On, okay, on I, that I didn't know. I, I was just I just wanted to know what the purpose of the yeah. their inclusion was. That's all I'm asking yeah. because there's we have a number of other items to go over with the board tonight as well in executive session. So yeah, including, I want to be sure the contract gets the full opportunity for the board to talk about so it can be voted on. That's all it's getting, you know, just want to be sure that we don't give that um, insufficient time. Yeah, right. and, and yeah. Um, and there's also a technical <laughs> issue as we come out of, um, how do we notify the public once we're out of executive session? Just Keith. like Just like before you would leave your breakout room and you'll go back in ah. regular session. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Very good, thank you. So, um, all right, so um, someone we have a... Jael, yes? Oh, who is saying something? Someone's trying to say something. So I just, Ford, can you tell me who the uh, those other administrators are? Again, I don't know that I got all of them added. I think you said Alicia, Stephen, who yeah. else? Lori, Jen, and Kelly. Jen. I believe Lori was already going to join us, right? So yeah, Kelly and Jen. So Kelly and Jen, Alicia and Stephen. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, we have Jael moving. 
Um, we haven't yet uh, voted. Um, so we have the motion and the second. So uh, once again, click yes to vote to go into executive session. And okay. You know, it, seems, oh. it seems that uh, I have an invitation to the breakout and I can vote by the oh. button. Okay. Yeah. Let, me, let me close the room then and, and, and we can reopen Lindy, it. Sorry about that. Lindy asked okay. if Jody should be included. I'm not sure which Jody she meant. I, I assume Jody Emerson, but I want to just. I'm, not, point I'm that out. not sure what all of them. I, I'm just I'm, curious as to what the topic is that we need all of our administrators in. And I, I am not personally prepared for a lengthy conversations about personnel tonight. Um, I don't know what the purpose of this is. I always appreciate knowing in advance what your focus is going to be so that I can have information available. Um, so well, we can invite the entire administrative team in if you wish. I just don't know um, what the purpose of the conversation is going to be. And it's not usual for me not to know. So I'm asking for clarification. So, Deborah, I would reference back to our conversation about a week or so ago about I had requested that we have the opportunity to get some clarity around the um, mailing that had gone out to staff on, I think it was March 20th in terms of um, some of the personnel issues. So I think this is kind of becoming part of that conversation given the letter of support. So um, while yes, we didn't say directly that that's what this was, I had requested to you that we at least have the opportunity to have that uh, memo and those that FAQ explained. So I believe sure. that's So I, I'm just wondering why all admin needs to be part of the conversation, but that is clearly your choice. Um, I don't, I'm not understanding the reasoning still. I do know about your question, Diane, and uh, I think the board has much to talk about if, in executive session. So you can certainly right. proceed and, if you wish. And what we will, what we will ensure is that um, we stay strictly within the guidelines for executive session and that no other, uh, no other topics are dealt with than those that are appropriate for executive session. So in executive so, session, um, we talk about the evaluation of an employee. We talk about um, the contract negotiations. If those are, are specific things in relation to personnel that we discuss. Um, so this, this might be an open session topic is all I'm saying in some ways. Yeah, if it if it turns out that it is, then that's what, how we'll that that's what we'll take it to. So, um, but I I think shall we shall we take the plunge, Keith? Can you? Are we ready? I can open it again if you're if you're ready, ready to go. Okay. We're ready. Thanks. Okay, welcome back everybody. So, um, <clears throat> I think we all should get a special certificate or give all of you a special certificate for hanging in there for so many hours tonight. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, this is probably just a fraction of what you all have been doing. So, um, anyway, all right. Uh, are we prepared for the motion, Jonas? Um, I, I will move to um, to approve the tentative agreement with the uh, teachers union pending the union ratification. Very good. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Lindy seconds. All right. So any further discussion? I don't see any. Uh, any signal, any sign of further discussion. So um, let's let's once again vote with uh, yes and no. You click on the participants on the bottom to give you that panel. So yes, um, and 
I see unanimous. Uh, Jael? Ah, <laughs> great. Fantastic. Wonderful. So the motion carries. And um, the next item on our agenda is adjournment. Um, I'm sure you'll be very sorry to hear that. Um, if there is no objection, we'll adjourn by consensus. Yeah? With, once again, thanks. <laughs> yes, Lindy, thank you so much. Take good care, everybody. Sleep well. Thanks for Good getting night. everything done. Good night, Good night everyone.